was a total lifetime dedication to his art. He could take care of business, but he had a very active sense of humor. He was a braggart in a way, but he never bragged about anything that he wasn't capable of. Everybody just loved him around the set because of his enthusiasm. He kept it pretty interesting. There's nobody I quite remember enjoying being a celebrity as he did. He was the catalyst that set that whole martial arts all in motion. And it's a shame he didn't live to see the impact that he had. He was not just a fighter. Bruce was a philosopher and a teacher. All type of knowledge ultimately means self-knowledge. As an actor, as a martial artist, as a human being, all these I have learned from martial art. His passion and talent helped make him one of the greatest action film stars the world has ever known. He was also one of the first actors to successfully bridge the culture gap between East and West. But for Bruce Lee, his personal life proved more dramatic and more intense than any movie plot. And though his style has often been imitated, the indelible mark he left behind nearly three decades ago has never been duplicated. On November 27, 1940, at both the hour and the year of the dragon, the child who would come to be known as Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco, California. The dragon in the Chinese zodiac is a mythical creature. It has a, a fierce uh, temper, it has tremendous power, it is quick, it is elusive, it is, it is everything that is exotic, and that's uh, fit Bruce Lee to a T. His father, Li Hoi Chuan, was a well-known film and stage actor who had toured with the Cantonese Opera Company. His mother, Grace, was a traditional Chinese woman whose superstitious nature caused her to fear for the safety of her infant son. Because his mother had lost a male child previously, it was believed that that was an omen. For that reason, she called him Sai Fong, which is like Little Phoenix, which is a feminine name, in the hopes that the spirits would think it was a female child and, and therefore bypass him and let him live. But it was the name given to him by a hospital nurse that stuck, Bruce. In 1941, as the war in Europe threatened to engulf the South Pacific, Lee moved Bruce and his family back to Hong Kong. As Hong Kong felt the hardships of World War II and the Japanese invasion, Lee continued to find work as an actor. Enjoying a thriving movie career, Bruce's father often brought his son to film sets with him, and by the age of six, the fledgling performer was cast in his first speaking role, seen here in this dubbed excerpt from Kid Chung. Here you are, sir. Uh, you like that chin, huh? Uh-huh, I sure wish I could throw a like that. I guess that's when it all started. The director, my father, even my father being an actor, I mean, they all said that he was a natural. Wait, you can't walk now. There's police all around. Even in these early films, the boy was showing the kind of charm, charisma, and body language that would mark his later screen appearances. If you look at some of his childhood roles, there's the thumbing of the nose, and there's that sort of grimace that he did when he got mad, and all of these carried over into uh, adult roles. But that was really Bruce. I mean, later he would say that was honest self-expression. Despite being nearsighted and somewhat frail as a child, the young actor was growing up to be a handsome, confident, and even cocky teenager. In addition to acting, Bruce also developed a love for dancing, winning first place in a number of cha-cha contests in Hong Kong. But for a handsome young actor and dancer, post-war Hong Kong was a tough place to grow up. Gangs ruled the city streets, and Lee was often forced to fight them. But Bruce liked a challenge and faced his adversaries head on. I remember when Bruce was about 14 years old, he always did like to fight. So there was a, a group of uh, students, classmates, that didn't quite like him. So one day when he walked out of school, they just jumped him and 
beat the heck out of him, you know. I guess he felt that he had to defend himself. In one such fight, Bruce took on the son of a feared triad gang member. Afraid of retaliation, his parents enrolled their son in his first martial arts class. Now training under Yip Man, a martial arts master and philosopher, Bruce was instructed in the ways of discipline and self-control. Beginning in his early teens, he became involved with Wing Chun Kung Fu, which was a form of martial arts. And uh, this was a philosophy that was very much about finding your power and delivering it in a very efficient way. To his parents' dismay, Bruce's street fighting continued, and the violent nature of his confrontations was escalating. In one of his last encounters, while he was removing his jacket, uh, the fellow he was squaring off against sucker punched him and blackened his eye, and Bruce flew into a rage and, and went after him and knocked the fellow out, you know, broke his tooth, broke his arm, and the police were involved. A police detective came up and he said, excuse me, Mr. Lee, he said, um, your son's been really fighting bad in school. And he said, if he gets into one more fight, I'm gonna have to put him in jail. To rescue their son from Hong Kong's mean streets, Lee's parents made the difficult decision to send their 18-year-old son to live with friends in the United States. We saw him off, and um, my father was a very old-fashioned man, okay? He never hugs anybody, nobody, you know? My father actually went over and hugged him, and that really took us all by surprise, you know? Now back at the place of his birth, Bruce settled in Seattle and soon found work at a restaurant owned by a family friend named Ruby Chow. But the rebellious young teenager was certain he was destined for more than waiting tables in Chinatown. Enrolling at the University of Washington, he began majoring in philosophy. Now gracefully blending his studies with martial arts, Bruce was developing a campus reputation for being something of a master. Soon, friends and classmates began flocking to him for instruction. When we first started out, he didn't charge anybody. And, and he never probably would have, but Bruce used to get frustrated, and so we finally said, look, Bruce, why don't you start a school and charge us money, and then you can go out on your own. In 1963, while still in college, Bruce opened the Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute. But before long, the instructor's attentions began focusing on one special student, a former cheerleader named Linda Emery. One day, we were on the campus of the University of Washington, and he said, OK, Linda, now I want you to throw me, and he showed me how to do it. So I threw him over on the grass, and he landed on the grass, and we were kind of laughing, and he said, let's go to the Space Needle for dinner. I said, you mean all of us? And he said, no, just you. And I was like, <laughs> that was our first date, October 25th, 1963. The relationship quickly became serious, but Linda's mother was not happy with her daughter's choice of a boyfriend. Interracial couples were not widely accepted in the 1960s, and Mrs. Emery doubted that the young philosophy student could provide a stable life for her daughter. Determined to prove her wrong, Bruce worked harder than ever to build his budding franchise of martial arts schools. And on August 17, 1964, Bruce and his former student, Linda, were married. That was one time in my life I knew that I was doing the absolutely right thing, that this man was a man of quality and integrity and great love and warmth, and that we were going to be OK. The couple moved to Oakland, California, where Bruce had already opened a second kung fu school. There, Bruce continued his practice of teaching any and all willing to learn. He didn't have any barriers of, of color or anything like that. He said, if your heart is right, he said, I'm going to teach you. He was one of the first to teach the true secrets of the martial arts to Americans and to non-Orientals. And there was a very strong feeling among many Asians that this was a corrupt practice. This was an improper thing to do. Within months of opening his new school, Lee was confronted by a hostile group of Asian martial arts masters. And they issued an ultimatum to Bruce Lee saying, stop teaching Caucasians or you're going to have to fight our top man. That, of course, was the wrong thing to say to Bruce Lee because he loved a challenge and also wasn't going to be told what to do by anybody. So I think the fight lasted three minutes. Bruce had subdued him, put him to the floor and made the man say in Chinese, I give up, I give up. But winning the fight wasn't enough. Feeling that he should have won in seconds, not minutes, Bruce began developing a strict regimen to revolutionize martial arts. Bruce Lee took a hard and objective look at the art of combat. 
and he came away with it with some very profound truths, such as it is constantly changing. You cannot expect to fight in a one-dimensional aspect when fighting is multi-dimensional. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Lee also hoped that martial arts would combat racism by bridging the gap between Eastern and Western cultures. And when he was invited to perform at Ed Parker's Karate Championship in Long Beach, California, he astonished the crowd with his famous one-inch punch. He would tighten his fist and just deliver that one-inch shot of impact. But during that short distance in time, he would generate all of his body weight into the point of impact. And he said, let me show you something. And he turned to Tom, to my teacher, who was then one of Parker's black belts. And he gave him his little kicking bag. He kicked Tom the length of a swimming pool and into a flower bed. I was impressed, to say the least. But despite his growing reputation in the martial arts field, Bruce Lee was frustrated. Still struggling to make ends meet, his schools were not bringing in enough money, and the future at best seemed uncertain. What he didn't know was that fame was just around the corner. On February 1st, 1965, Bruce and Linda celebrated the birth of their first child, Brandon Bruce Lee. Bruce's greatest joy in his whole life was, was his children. He wanted to have a boy because it's a very Chinese thing to have a boy to carry on. He had a very, very, you know, keen sense of, of love for his son, and, and he used to always brag and say, he's the only blonde-haired, blue-eyed child in the world. <laughs> But just one week after Brandon's birth, tragedy struck when Bruce received word that his father, Lee Hoi Chuan, had died in Hong Kong. After flying home to attend the funeral, Lee returned to America more determined than ever to make his family proud of him. He focused all of his attentions on perfecting a distinctive style of martial arts, eventually called Jeet Kune Do, or the way of the intercepting fist. He told us uh, Jeet Kune Do was a bunch of concepts and philosophies and strategies. And you take out and make it fit into you. It's like a coat. You, everyone cannot sit, fit into a size 42 coat. It has to be tailor-made for you. He believed that he could take the best of many different kinds of fighting, a piece here and a piece there, from boxing, wrestling, martial arts, all sorts of different physical activity, and incorporate it into a single philosophy. Ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. I mean, it, it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky. So I can show you some f really fancy movement, but to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, not that, my friend, is <laughs> very hard to do. While Bruce was busy pouring all of his energy into martial arts, veteran TV producer William Dozier was searching for an Asian actor one that could star in a new TV series he was developing based on the classic Charlie Chan mysteries. A friend of Dozier's, Hollywood hairstylist Jay Sebring, had recently seen Lee perform at the Ed Parker tournament and enthusiastically recommended him to the producer. He said, well, listen, I've got the guy for you. It's a fellow by the name of Bruce Lee. He's a good-looking man. He's uh, got tremendous charisma. I'll call and see if there's some footage to show you. So he did, and as soon as Dozier saw it, he knew he had his man. Test X1. Thank you. Now, Bruce, just look right into the camera lens right here and tell us your name, your age, and where you were born. My last name is Lee, Bruce Lee. I was born in San Francisco in 1940. I'm 24 right now. And you worked in uh, motion pictures in Hong Kong? Yes, uh, since I was around six years old. And when did you leave Hong Kong? 1959, when I was 18. I see. Now look over to me, Bruce, as we talk. Uh, I understand you just had a baby boy? Yeah. And uh, you've lost a little sleep over it, have you? Oh, three nights. <laughs> In 1965, Dozier ordered this screen test for Bruce at 20th Century Fox Studios. There is the finger jab, there is the punch, there is the back fist, and then low. Of course, then they use leg, straight at the groin, all come up. Or, if I can back up a little bit, 
They start back from here and then come back. All right. It's kind of work. Unfortunately for Bruce, Dozier was now busy preparing his upcoming Batman series. Charlie Chan's number one son was scrapped. Although Dozier promised Bruce that he would keep him in mind for his next project, one based on a classic radio drama from the 1930s, The Green Hornet. They wanted to offer Bruce the part of Cato, but that wasn't going to happen until the following year because they wanted to make sure that Batman worked. So there we were, and now having moved to Los Angeles, and Bruce didn't have a job. Bruce Lee didn't have to wait very long. To the Batcave. Batman became a national phenomenon, and within weeks, Dozier began prepping the Green Hornet. No need for panic, Mr. Smith. After all, we're both on the same side of the law. Just cut us in on your racket. That's all we are after. Racket? It's getting late, boss. If we're going to be partners, Mr. Smith, we mustn't keep secrets from one another. Everything on a table where we can all see it. Impressed with Bruce's screen presence, if not his acting, ABC network executives accepted Dozier's choice of Lee as Cato, the crime-fighting chauffeur. And now, to protect the rights and lives of decent citizens, rides the Green Hornet. When the show premiered on Friday, September 9th, 1966, Bruce Lee leapt onto the screen and into stardom. He went from being a martial arts instructor to someone that everybody watched in prime time in North America. No one had ever seen anything like that. Soon the fan mail Bruce was receiving was out pulling that of the star. Starring in the role of millionaire newspaper publisher Britt Reed, alias the Green Hornet, was a dashing all-American heartthrob named Van Williams. No more tricks, Carly. I'm here to talk business. The thing that impressed me about him then is, as always, was his intensity. You know, he was very, very intense. You know, if we ever meet up with that masked Kung Fu man again, I want him. But a very nice gentleman. Take it easy, miss. We won't hurt you. From that moment on, Bruce and I kind of started working on a friendship all, of, all through the series. After years of financial insecurity, Bruce was now a regular in a network TV series. And although his role was secondary to that of Van Williams, he was determined not to play Cato as a subordinate. He didn't want any chop sake or pigtail or bowing and scraping and that kind of thing, the way that Chinese had been um, portrayed. So that was his rule, that he would not do any roles demeaning to the Chinese culture. A perfectionist, Bruce worked hard to make his fight scenes as authentic as possible. Kung Fu is Kung Fu. It's not child's play. He soon learned the compromises required when filming for television. We had to slow up his action because we found in the test that he was moving too fast for the speed of the motion picture film. People may not realize he could have been faster than he was. Never as campy or colorful as their caped counterparts. Holy uncanny photographic mental processes. The Green Hornet and Cato failed to catch on with primetime audiences. <laughs> In a desperate effort to save the show, Dozier and ABC concocted a face-off between Batman and Robin and the Green Hornet and Kato. No Batmobile. Good. We can get some work done first, and fast. And the original script was that he gets into a fight with Robin and loses. Holy split seconds, let's go! Well, he just went right through the roof, and he said there is no way I'm going to get into a fight with Robin and lose. Bert had told everybody, you know, he's a big black belt and big tough guy. And Bruce had heard all about this. So he was going to play his Chinese water torture game on him. He let out little words. He was going to get this guy. And Bruce comes in and he gives him the silent treatment, you know. And he's grumbling around and said, you know, it's Bert thought he was just going to lose his temper and just destroy him. 
Adam said that Burt Ward was just shaking in his shorts. He was so scared that Bruce was going to take after him. Ultimately, the producers ended the battle in a draw to avoid upsetting fans of either show. None too smart for a smart crime fighter. Are we just letting them go, Batman? But it didn't matter. The Green Hornet was canceled after just one season. That was unquestionably a big blow to Bruce Lee. He had hoped that the show would be more successful. He had hoped to use that as a springboard, and it didn't work out. With the cancellation of the Green Hornet, the future was once again uncertain. And despite a new legion of loyal fans and the powerful contacts he had made in the entertainment industry, Bruce Lee would again be facing tough times. Now 27, Bruce had hoped the Green Hornet would open doors for him. Instead, he found work only sporadically, making a few guest appearances in shows like Here Come the Brides. I did not meet the ship because I refused to marry a woman I've never seen. Lin Soon, decision, not yours. The society arranges all marriages. I am no longer a part of the society. I resign. Perhaps you wish to speak to Chi Pei. You could explain your reasonings to him. I will explain nothing to Chi Pei. Now, I am no longer a member of the society. Is that understood? Unable to find work as an actor, he hired himself out as a fight coordinator on films like The Wrecking Crew, starring Dean Martin. Those years were very difficult to break into Hollywood. There became a racial barrier that prevented him from crossing over into the Hollywood establishment. Frustrated and with a family to support, Bruce turned to his friend, Green Hornet producer, Charles Fitzsimons, for advice. And I said, well, wait a minute, Bruce, I have an idea. I said, how about teaching people in their own homes where you don't have to have a studio? And I explained to him all of the middle-aged, would-be, uh, macho uh, individuals in the motion picture industry and in business. These are your potential clients. Now attracting celebrity students like James Coburn, Steve McQueen, and basketball legend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bruce became the hottest martial arts coach in Hollywood. He was not like most of the other people in the martial arts who had a tendency to be very formal and stiff. He's very down to earth, uh, very American when you're working out, and he always wanted to make the most use of your time together with him. Uh, you had to have done your homework and be ready to go. But of all of Bruce's pupils, his favorite was his son, Brandon. Brandon was a mositong, couldn't sit still little kid. And as soon as he could walk, Bruce was having him learn kicks and punches and all that kind of thing. And Brandon had endless amounts of energy, just like his dad. As proud as Bruce was of his son, he was equally proud of his second child, daughter Shannon, born April 19th, 1969. She was as much a girl as Brandon was a boy. Uh, Shannon just had Bruce around her little finger, daddy's little girl. It was like an angel had come to live at our house when Shannon was born. It's funny, but I guess when Bruce Lee is your dad, he's your dad. We weren't the sort of kids that went around saying, well, my dad's Bruce Lee and he could, you know, beat up your dad. <laughs> Even though I'm sure that's true for the most part. <laughs> Despite what his children thought, Bruce was not invincible. One morning in 1970, while working out with weights, he injured a major nerve in his back, which left him unable to train for six months. Frustrated, he poured his energy into refining his philosophy of Jeet Kune Do and began writing extensively on every aspect of martial arts combat. Doctors came to Bruce with devastating news. They told him that he would never be able to perform martial arts again. Vowing to prove them wrong, Lee, once healthy enough to train, set up an exhaustive daily fitness regimen. What he did, again, uh, turning a stumbling block into a stepping stone. He wanted to see just what the limitations uh, and capabilities of the human body were. He would do 2,000 punches a day, you know, 1,000 kicks a day. He would uh, run three miles and get on a bike and bike 15 miles. All of it was pushing to see what the human body was truly capable of. 
Anxious to get his acting career back on track, Bruce worked closely with screenwriter Sterling Siliphant and actor James Coburn on a film idea entitled The Silent Flute. Bruce had originated the idea for a screenplay that he called The Silent Flute. Warner Brothers was interested in doing it. It was the picture that was going to break Bruce into Hollywood. And we lived on that hope for several years there in the difficult years. So that was a crushing disappointment to Bruce when that film was never made. Still teaching martial arts, Bruce felt Hollywood had turned its back on him as an actor. Looking for work, he traveled to Hong Kong to promote himself and meet with Asian filmmakers. Run Run Shaw was the biggest Asian filmmaker. Unfortunately, the bid was a, a standard offer that he offered his contract players, which was like $200 a week uh, for about seven years. Well, that wasn't what Bruce was looking for, so he politely declined. Back in Hollywood in 1971, Bruce collaborated with Sterling Siliphant on a script for TV's popular Longstreet series. Guest appearing as a martial arts master, Bruce was in fact so well received by the show's producers that he was offered a recurring role. But by now, Lee's status in Asia had changed. On a trip back to Hong Kong, he was astonished to discover that the Green Hornet had become hugely popular. Asian fans now referred to it as the Cato Show. And when he arrived there, thousands of people would come to the airport. He couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed the way that uh, Tom Cruise, I guess, today might be mobbed if he walked out on the street. As a result of his newfound fame, Bruce was asked to star in a film for top Asian producer Raymond Chow. Bruce expressed that he would like very much to come back to Hong Kong to make pictures. And I called him on the phone, and we started a conversation. The whole thing clicks. Then uh, we signed a three-picture deal, and he came back, and the rest is history. Bruce's first assignment for Raymond Chow was as the star of a modestly budgeted martial arts film entitled The Big Boss. Introducing Bruce Lee. Every limb of his body is a lethal weapon against men. We're savage beasts. Hong Kong moviegoers are renowned for being very vocal. <coughs> and they have even been known to, like, cut the seats with a knife or something if they didn't like the movie. So we're sitting there. The crowd is hushed. And he thinks, for a second he thinks, oh my god, they hate it. The audience, I said, was sort of dumbfound at the end of the thing. Until everybody broke out into thunderous uh, applause. The big boss broke all previous box office records in Asia, and Bruce Lee was on his way to becoming an international star. But instead of taking his newfound celebrity status for granted, he pushed himself even harder. In his next film for Raymond Chow, Fist of Fury, Lee introduced the nunchaku, a weapon never before seen in a martial arts film. Once again, the film broke all box office records. But success has many rivals, and one of them was film producer Run Run Shaw. Hoping to steal Bruce away from Raymond Chow, he tempted the actor with a blank check for his services. Instead, Bruce remained loyal to Raymond Chow. He proposed an equal partnership for a series of films. It was an offer Chow couldn't and didn't refuse. Professionally confident and financially secure, Bruce Lee had conquered Asia. But his real goal had eluded him. Bruce Lee wanted to take on the world. In Hollywood, old habits die hard. And despite international fame as a martial arts superstar, Bruce Lee seemed no match for domestic prejudices. It was very difficult to convince people who could give a green light to a project that uh, an Asian hero would, would work as a marquee draw. They think that business-wise, it's a risk. And I don't blame them. In the same way, it's like in Hong Kong, if a foreigner come and became a star, if I were the man with the money, 
I probably would have my own worry of whether or not the acceptance would be there. But that's all right, because if you, if you honestly express yourself, it doesn't matter. Bruce Lee, before he left for Hong Kong, was working with Warner Brothers, with Fred Weintraub, in developing a concept for a television show set in the Old West, and it was going to be called The Warrior at that point. It was later changed to Kung Fu. Uh, they never apparently considered him at all for the lead because, in their words, he was too Chinese-looking. And what happened was they ended up giving the role to a Caucasian actor, David Carradine, who they tried to make up to look half Chinese. Bitter at what he considered Hollywood's racism, Bruce now turned all of his attentions to his partnership with Raymond Chow. Having developed a keen interest in filmmaking while starring in The Green Hornet, Lee now oversaw all aspects of his new film, Way of the Dragon. It's Lee Unleashed. He wrote it, he choreographed it, he starred in it, he played percussion and the music for the film. He had about eight hats on, you know, and it was his first ever directorial debut. Lee, unmarshaled. Bruce was given the creative control he desired and made sure that his performance and the film would live up to his audience's growing expectations. One of the film's highlights was this grueling fight scene between Lee and his former student, Chuck Norris. At the beginning of that fight scene, Bruce Lee's character is losing because he's in a very rigid martial arts way. Chuck Norris's character is also rigid and he's a more powerful, bigger individual. Bruce at that point changes tactics and starts bouncing around like Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Robinson and uh, being non-telegraphic and as a result Bruce Lee emerges victorious. Bruce stressed the need to show the ability to adapt instantly to whatever the situation was in front of you. Way of the Dragon smashed all previous box office records and within weeks of its release Bruce was busy prepping fight scenes for his next film, Game of Death. Co-starring would be his friend and former pupil Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I was flabbergasted, you know, this is something that we had dreamed about, but, you know, we'd never really gotten a green light from anybody. It was a great experience. But before Game of Death was completed, Bruce finally got the call from Hollywood he had waited for all his life. He was offered his first starring role in an American film, Enter the Dragon. It would be a big budget martial arts blockbuster and a validation of Bruce's years of dedication to his art. Now, more than ever, Bruce Lee was considered the number one martial arts practitioner in the world, on and off the set. Some kid was sitting on a, on a wall, questioning his, whether he was just an actor, or could he really do any of the things that uh, he had been doing. And Bruce walked close to him, and then it was just snap, and he hit him. And, and the kid had a bloody nose and, and raised his hands, and that was it. To their eyes, uh, he was like Billy the Kid. People would, would try and take pokes at him when he was walking down the street. But Bruce would just, you know, use all the savvy that he developed and just play with these guys and, in fact, would make a move on them and then correct their forms. Though Bruce was physically fit and at the top of his game, something was seriously wrong. He was training for something that would never come, a fight that would never happen. Bruce seemed to be on a seven-day-a-week schedule. He was just working hard, and he knew it. But with the success of Enter the Dragon, he would have achieved that place where he could pick and choose a little bit, take his time to find the right properties and develop them. So he was on the cusp of realizing his dreams. On May 10, 1973, while editing Enter the Dragon in a Hong Kong studio, Bruce Lee became dizzy and collapsed. Rushed to the hospital, the actor appeared very close to death, although doctors couldn't determine the cause. Undergoing a battery of tests, he recovered sufficiently to return to work, and after completing Enter the Dragon, resumed work on the unfinished Game of Death. He was working with a Chinese actress who he thought might uh, be involved in the film as well. So he was at her house and um, he complained that he had a headache and she gave him a prescription tablet that she had called Equagesic, and he went into another room and lay down. But when she couldn't wake him a few hours later, actress Betty Ting Pei called Raymond Chow. The phone rang and they said, 
I don't know what happens, but I couldn't wake up Bruce. So why don't you come? So in a hurry, I went to Betty's place, and uh, Bruce looked very pale. Raymond Chow called me and told me I should go to the hospital. And so I took a taxi to the hospital, and I just remember that I couldn't ask if he had died. And I said, is he alive? And they said, no. On July 20th, 1973, at the age of 32, Bruce Lee, martial arts master, was dead. We were shocked. I, I, I definitely was shocked. Um, my mom was, of course, you know, she was torn apart really bad. Because she, I mean, she was so proud of Bruce. And here was a man in the peak of health. And one day he just expired. No car accident, no external source, no great illness. And so people needed to find a reason. But as news spread throughout the world, so did rumors that his death was no accident. Had he been murdered, some wondered? The target of retaliation by angry Hong Kong gangs? Some even speculated that Lee had been killed by a curse imposed by Asian martial arts masters, still angry that he had revealed their secrets to non-Asians. As far as, uh, uh, you know, rumors of a curse or rumors of this and that, it's, there's just no bearing. I mean, uh, I suppose when, when someone passes away, you can say whatever you want. You know, you could say he was done in by gremlins, but there's equal evidence for gremlins as there is, is for a curse. An autopsy revealed the cause of Lee's death to be cerebral edema, or swelling of the brain, an allergic reaction to the pill he had taken to alleviate his headache. The scientific medical evidence was extremely clear. So, you may call it a freak accident, but uh, absolutely nothing else. Within days, more than 20,000 mourners crowded the streets of Hong Kong to pay their respects to the fallen superstar. Following a memorial service, his body was taken to Seattle, where Bruce and his wife had met and fallen in love. Among those at the funeral were close friends James Coburn and Steve McQueen, who served as pallbearers. At the age of only 32, Bruce Lee had left behind a wife, two children, and an unrivaled legacy in the world of entertainment and martial arts. But ironically, it would be the films in which he didn't appear where his legend would live on. desperate effort to salvage Bruce Lee's last film, the producers hired a look-alike actor and resorted to obvious and at times laughable camera tricks. Cut! Okay, that's a print. That was great, Billy. Okay, everybody. Get the but mixed results couldn't prevent Game of Death from being an enormous financial success. On the strength of five films, Bruce Lee had forever redefined the action movie genre and opened the doors for martial arts superstars like Jackie Chan, Chuck Norris, Steven Seagal, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Just about everybody now who does action resorts to some form of karate or kickboxing or something like that. But of all the actors who dared fill the fallen star's footprints, the one with the greatest chance seemed to be Bruce's only son, Brandon. A weird question to me when people ask me about, you know, following in my father's footsteps. Because if by that you mean doing really excellent films and uh, doing the kind of work that my father did, doing that, that quality of work, that level of work, absolutely, you know, absolutely that's what I want to do. But if you mean trying to imitate him in some way, you know, trying to uh, uh, be a poor man's Bruce Lee, not at all. I started learning martial arts with my dad right about the time I could walk. And we moved from, from Hong Kong to Los Angeles a lot. 
when I was growing up as we were following my father's career around. And the thing is, I always think to myself, no matter what happens to me in my career, it's probably never going to get as weird as it already was. Having made a name for himself in a small number of modestly successful films, the young actor seemed poised on the brink of superstardom as the title character in the supernatural thriller, The Crow. But on March 31st, 1993, nearly 20 years after his father's untimely death, Brandon Lee was accidentally killed on the set by the misfiring of an unchecked prop gun. And like Game of Death, The Crow was completed with the aid of body doubles and special effects. Unfortunately, the bizarre circumstances surrounding Brandon Lee's death did little to quell the ever-growing myths about a mysterious curse. With Brandon's death, there was a resurgence of the rumors about Bruce's death. There was a rehashing of them in the public again. And there was an attempt to connect the deaths of Bruce and Brandon. And really, that's a great disservice and a great tragedy trying to connect it up with uh, curses and falsehoods and rumors is not right. Brandon's death was the result of the most unfortunate and unlikely freakish chain of events than that could ever be imagined. In a way, I'm glad that Bruce was not here to see this happen to Brandon, because it would have hurt him so badly, as it has all of us. To millions around the world, the name Bruce Lee looms larger than ever. Magazines continue to print articles about him. Fan clubs are devoted to him and his martial arts philosophy continues to attract a growing number of devoted followers. One of the most amazing things from my perspective on Bruce Lee was that a man of 32 years of age could be so prolific. He created a new film genre, he created a self-help philosophy, which is absolutely uh, brilliant, and he created a new martial art, you know, which people have been carrying on since his passing. So the important thing about Bruce Lee is not how he died or that he died, it's that he lived. To me, he's still alive. His spirit's still there, and we still train his, in his art. He's probably the best friend you can have. Uh, he's very loyal. Uh, he once told me that if somebody is trying to attack you, I'll take them on. That's a friend. The integrity with which Bruce lived his life, what he believed to be right, uh, that is a clear example of the way it should be done. I, I remember um, he said, all right, if I'm gone, for any reason, uh, don't get hooked up with all these people that are, they're going to be giving me parades. If they're giving me parades, something's wrong. He was definitely somebody to look up to and something to aspire to. He had such a passion for life. I strive to have as much passion. If I could, like, rewind time and do it all over again, I would have asked so many more questions and learned so much more. He certainly left a gift for the rest of us, a path to follow, footsteps to follow, so that we can start in a direction and then find our own way, which was his lesson. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Be water, my friends.